So instead of beginning with the Chinese and their goldfish, or even with the first recorded instance of a man crying over a dead fish, which is actually a Roman general named Crassus, who cried over the death of his pet eel around 104 BC, and people made a lot of fun of him for it, because he cried more at the funeral of his eel than he cried at the funeral of his wife. But instead of beginning with that, I want to begin with a little known woman to whom we owe our hobby. Anna Constantina Thin, which I know it looks like it should be Thine, but it's pronounced Thin, was married to Lord John Thin. And she was by trade a geologist, but history remembers her as the woman who made the first balanced marine aquarium in 1846. And you might be wondering, you know, people have kept fish for thousands of years. The ancients kept fish all the time. And I mean, by the 17th century, a lot of people in London were keeping goldfish in bowls by that point. But the thing is, before Anna Thin, nobody knew what they were doing. All they knew was if you change the water, you know, the fish, you know, might live. Anna Thin came along and she figured out how to recreate the processes of nature within a confined space. And she actually kind of did it by accident. Uh, Anna, Th Anna Thin's first love was not marine biology. She just liked rocks. And the story goes that one day she was walking around the beach at Torquay and she picked up what she thought was a rock. And then she noticed, oh man, this thing's alive. What had happened, she had actually picked up a piece of madrepore. And that's the same species of coral as like Acropora or Montipora. Um, I don't know exactly which species of Montipora was. It's a huge family of corals. Uh, I couldn't find anything specific uh, in any of the research I did. But she picked up a piece of that and she noticed, oh, this thing's alive. And she wanted to try to keep it alive. She became really curious about it. So she plops that thing in a jar and she takes it back to London. So around the 1800s, people were starting to realize the relationship between people, plants, animals, and oxygen. They were beginning to realize that there was a cycle happening. And what Anna Thin realized was there must be a similar cycle that's happening underwater. So what she did with her piece of coral that she had in her jar, she added some seaweed, and then she changed the water every day. Now, she didn't have easy access to seawater in London. And that's why we know that it was a balanced aquarium. So she had a servant every day. The servant would go in and kind of like shake up the water a little bit. She'd change the water in the jar from jar to jar and that would aerate the water. And after a little bit of trial and error, she got the jar balanced. She kept that coral and seaweed alive for three years. It's difficult to understate how important this realization was to the hobby. Without a balanced aquarium, all you're doing is keeping a goldfish in a bowl. That's what we try to do with marine aquariums today. We try to create the cycle that happens in nature. And Anna Thin was the first one to realize that you could do that. After a few years of keeping the coral and the seaweed in the jar alive, a famous biologist named Philip Henry Goss would hear about Anna Thin's little jar on the windowsill. He would come out and look at it, and it would later inspire him for the work he would do at the London Zoo. Philip Henry Goss was the first man to build in a public aquarium, which he called the London Fish House. Because at that time, nobody really knew what to call the glass box where you put a fish. But later, Philip Henry Goss would give the London Fish House a much catchier name. He would call it an aquarium. Okay, so in the history of the hobby uh, series I'm doing here, what I want to do is recreate some of the things that the people that were starting to figure out the hobby, like Anne Thin, recreate what they were doing. So what I'm going to do in the next part of this series is I'm going to go get a jar, and I'm going to see what I can keep alive in it. And I'm going to do it just like Anne Thin did. No filter, no heater, no light, and I want to see what we can get balanced. See if it's even possible with the corals we have in today's hobby. Because one of the things I will make note of that Anna Thin was, you, uh, had gotten a cold water madrepore. That was something from Torquay, something from England. You know, most of the corals we have in the hobby today are tropical corals, are tropical organisms that need pretty warm water to be happy. So uh, if you guys have any suggestions for what you think I might be able to keep alive in a jar, uh, with no filter, no heater, no light. Let me know in the comments below. I need some help here. See, in my mind, I'm thinking something like um, some NPS corals, the uh, non-photosynthetic photosynthetic stonies. 
Uh, something like that, because I think with the limited amount of light that it'll get, something like that will do much better than something that needs a lot of light. So let me know what you guys think. Let me hear your ideas, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.